hi. I saw from a distance the mail officer burying my mail here, which is what we do in Canada. So I'm gonna dig it up. It's addressed to me, Greer. Let's see what's inside. Are wolves turning into seals? Okay, so right off the bat, I am going to answer the question, are wolves turning into seals? No. <laughs> now I would like to introduce a second question. Is the subpopulation of North American gray wolf inhabiting a narrow range of temperate rainforest in Nearshore Island, extending from Vancouver Island, British Columbia to the Alexander Archipelago in Southeast Northern Alaska, turning into seals? Maybe? So the Halstuck First Nation people have known about these wolves for a while. They've known that these coastal wolves are not the same as the wolves farther inland. They are specialized. They are behaviorally and physically different. And I'll rattle off a few of those differences just to illustrate. Um, they are smaller than average with short, coarse fur. Temperate rainforests don't get very cold in the winter, so there's no need to have like stout bodies or thick coats. Uh, they're often dark and reddish, which blends perfectly with the algae on shoreline rocks. And in 1981, this briefly got them labeled as Canis lupus fuscus, which means dusky. So between uh, 50 to 75 percent of their diet comes from the water, uh, in particular marine mammals and spawning salmon, the latter of which they've developed specialized behaviors to consume. You see, the body of the salmon often has a high parasitic load, so the wolves have learned to only eat the heads. Bears can eat the fatty body of the salmon because during hibernation, the tapeworms in their bellies are starved, but wolves do not have this luxury. And the coastal wolves tend to get wet quite a bit. The islands are smaller than a wolf's natural home range, which results in them frequently swimming between land masses. In 2005, mitochondrial DNA was collected from gray wolves in Alaska, Alberta, and the Northwest Territories, and the population proved unique in its possession of an endemic haplotype at greater than 5% frequency. In fact, it was at 19%. Wow. A haplotype is just a group of linked genes you inherit from one parent. So the significance of this finding is that there is more evolutionary divergence between the coastal wolves in British Columbia and the wolves more inland in the same province than there are between existing established wolf subspecies. And this is enough for these coastal wolves to be considered an evolutionary significant unit, or a population considered distinct for the purpose of conservation. Traditional thought is that wolves have a limited population structure. They are vagile, meaning they tend to wander and disperse before breeding, sometimes over 100 kilometers. And they treat mountains as corridors to walk down rather than as obstacles. Arctic tundra, boreal forest, desert, mountain, rainforest. You can name the ecosystem and I will show you a very happy wolf. So traditional thought is that all this wandering and surviving in every condition would spread their genes out pretty evenly. You would not get any pockets of wolves gone weird anywhere because they're always mixing things up. Thing is, traditional thought ain't worth a plugged nickel because along the west coast we've got future seals. I apologize to the people with more advanced knowledge, but I would like to go over the basics of speciation. This is where an organism like Canis lupus splits into multiple species. The classic example is allopatric speciation, where a geographic boundary is created over time, uh, splitting a species into reproductively isolated populations that develop their own mutations and adaptations to the changing local environment. There's also genetic drift at play. Due to random statistical chance, some genes will disappear from the population, while others become fixed at 100% frequency. You can also have new genes introduced in each population through migration and hybridization with local animals. So, say something happens to this mountain. Four million years have passed, and rock-eating goblins have eaten a tunnel connecting the two sides. The populations are reunited. What happens? Maybe not enough time has passed and there aren't enough changes, so they just interbreed, creating a cline, which is a gradient down which species traits change. Or maybe secondary reproductive isolation occurs. Epistatic interactions are when two genes acting together 
have a different effect than they would acting alone. Uh, epistatic interactions are why a good number of hybrid animals, like mules, are sterile. Uh, if this occurs, then you get secondary contact reproductive isolation, also known as the Wallace effect. You see this in flowers that are normally white, but suddenly become vibrantly colored when they share territory with a reproductively incompatible relative. Making shitty, sick kids is a waste of everyone's energy and resources, so it's in your best interest to identify yourself as your own species to avoid hybridization with fur markings, petal colors, or a mating dance. But we are supposed to be talking about the future seals. Why is no one talking about the future seals? Mountains are a boundary for most terrestrial animals. In that last example, a new mountain drove allopatric speciation. But as we've established, geographic boundaries mean nothing to a wolf. They go where they want, they do what they want. And in a species like this, you'd expect speciation to be nearly impossible. There's just too much gene flow. Wrong! There's also sympatric speciation! This is where a new species emerges within a population. There is no geographic separation. It's like if, in Toronto, Canada, Torontonians start slowly becoming human version 2s while still being fully connected to the outside world with planes and cars full of breedable human version 1s entering all the time allowing for constant gene flow. It seems like an impossible scenario for speciation. In fact, it's so hard to find examples of this in nature that for a while, folk thought it was purely theoretical. Ernst Mayer said, hey, it's real, guys. And everyone else said, okay, then show us, pal. And he said, mm, I cannot. It is happening, though, in the coastal wolves. More specifically, a special case called heteropatric speciation is happening. This is when different ecotypes of the same species geographically coexist, but exploit different niches. Dispersing grey wolves strongly prefer conditions like those they grew up in. This is called natal homing. Coastal wolves don't know how to gang together to take down and dismember moose farther inland, and inland wolves don't know how to eat salmon without ingesting buckets full of parasites and dying. If the West Coast population of wolves can be used as an early stage example of heteropatric speciation, does this mean they are branching out from the rest of the wolf whatevers and turning into seals? Well, let's take a look at seals. Pinnipeds evolved in the late Oligocene, meaning they're 27 to 25 million years old, and we only found their missing link connection to terrestrial mammals in 2007, with a 24 million year old fossil called Pugili. Darwini. It kind of looks like a sea otter. Digression time! If a sea otter is a rough morphological match for the earliest semi seal ancestor we can find, how adapted to the water can they really be? Well, when entering the sea, mammals are essentially released from gravity. They get big. Sometimes they get to be the biggest thing that ever lived. Sea otters can reach 100 pounds, making them the heaviest of the mustelids, but one of the lightest marine mammals out there. Their fur is the densest in the animal kingdom, keeping cold water from their skin. Their nostrils and reduced ears can close underwater. Their hind feet are flattened and webbed for kicking, making them awkward walkers on land. Their tail is short, thick, slightly flattened and muscular. Their bones are denser, displaying osteosclerosis to help them dive. Their lung capacity is 2.5 times larger than a comparative land mammal, and they have long, highly sensitive whiskers to help find prey in murky water. Are you listening to this, wolf? You think you're ready for the sea? You think you're ready for that? I just got so excited by that that my cat thought I was like having a nervous breakdown and came to hang out with me. Hi, Finger. I'm good. I promise I'm good. I'm just talking about seals and it makes me really happy. Please go away now. I love you. No, fuck. Oh, God. All right, I'm taking a break. If... The wolves are turning into sea otters, and the sea otters are turning into seals. Are the seals turning into whales? Is that how evolution works? No. <laughs> but basically, the longer an animal has been in the water, 
the more aquatic adaptations they are likely to display because, you know, it helps them survive. So the otters have had a few million years and they've still got four distinguishable legs. The seals have had 24 million years and they're still reliant on the land. They come on here to breed. Um, whales have had 40 million years and they, they actually have it bagged. Uh, they did it. 40 million years, folks, that is the sweet spot. So how long have our coastal wolves had? Um, during the last glacial maximum, or time when ice sheets covered the continent, no suitable refugium existed for wolves in the west, a refugium being an ice-free place where animals can take refuge and wait for the glaciers to retreat. Uh, the Alaskan wolf population went extinct at this time, so all the genetic differentiation, the vida, differentiation of BC's coastal wolves versus the inland wolves must have evolved after the wolves returned in the Holocene, so probably within the last 12,000 years. So are wolves turning into seals? Maybe if we let them cook a little bit longer, yeah. In 1999, British Columbia had a stable population of 8,000 wolves, and I'm sure nothing will get in the way of that. Projected sea level rise. BC wolf call. Interbreeding with dog. Canine illnesses spreading. Clear cutting the rainforest which used to spread to California. Continued forestry. Ah well, here's a cool concept. The first time I recorded my audio for this, it was unlistenable because it was kind of like I got possessed by the ghost of a David Attenborough whisper ASMR YouTuber. Ugh. So in the spirit of my early attempt, I'm going to replicate this in thanking my beautiful patrons. I'm going to do my best job to imitate everything I've deleted off my laptop. Summer Chisel, Mary Nunes, Tina, Alison Berry, Zenny Ragston, Elena Boyce, Lana Roberts, Lisa W, Laura Sprague, Eggcats, Sampegano, Kathleen McCormick, Galahad, Mary Stewart, Christian Bridgler, Stephen Dan, Jordan Shodek, Mary M, Emily Neal, Tamara, Megan G. Gerard A, Megan Duke, and Anne Musica. I don't know what ASMR people actually do. Alright, so, um, for serious though, I really appreciate you Patreon folk supporting me. This video would not be possible without that. And if you would like your name to be read in an offensive accent in my next video, um, just drop $5 into my Patreon. Uh, the price of an undrinkably ornamented Starbucks coffee. And uh, thank you again so much for supporting me, and I hope this video changed your life.